uniting church in Australia. Officially, this will take place in June 1977. In anticipation of this historical event, and after many months of planning, St Andrew's Presbyterian Church, Mount Gambier, Wesley and Gambier East Methodist Churches, together with the four Methodist churches in what was formerly the Port Macdonald circuit, are uniting on this day to form the Mount Gambier and District United Parish. The Uniting Churches take this opportunity of expressing their appreciation to the general media for publicising the inauguration of the United Parish and especially to Channel 8 for televising this service. And now as we go into Wesley Church Mount Gambier for the inaugural service of the United Parish, the ministers and people of the Uniting Churches invite you to join with them in this act of celebration and dedication. In the name of the risen Christ, it gives me great joy to welcome you all to this service of celebration and dedication here this morning. Let's be upstanding to commence our worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And forget not all his O oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Let us pray. Father, we come to you now in silence, yet shouting for joy. We come in silence, overawed by the thought of your love for us. You rule supreme over time and space, yet you loved us so much that you gave your only Son to suffer and die for us. To think that you love us like that takes our breath away. We are struck dumb. There is nothing we can say. And yet we cannot stay silent when we think of your love for us. You gave us new birth into a living hope when you brought Jesus back from death so that we could make a new start in life, free from the guilt and shame of the past, confident that nothing in death or life can separate us from your love. To think that you love us like that makes us long to break our silence, to shout for joy and to sing your praise. Father, accept our worship and praise, both silent and spoken, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The hymn, I to the hills will lift mine eyes. to our prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. 
Let us thank God for all that is past in the life of the church, for the early church of which we read in the Acts of the Apostles, where Christians committed themselves to Christ and each other for the sake of the gospel. For the witness of the church in the Roman Empire, at great cost, calling people to become citizens of the kingdom of God. For the light of the church in the dark ages, preserving the things that must never die until the Holy Spirit should bring them to a new birth. We thank you, Lord, and we For the reformation and its discovery of the truth that every person is able to make his own response to the grace that reaches out to all. We thank you, Lord, and we thank you, For the evangelical revival of the 18th century, its renewal of personal faith, its exposure of social ills and eagerness to spread the gospel of hope and healing through the world. We thank you, Lord, and we thank you. For the ecumenical movement through which many Christians are striving to find that unity which Christ intends for his church. And now let us thank God for all that continues in the life of the church. Father, we thank you for the Bible, pointing to God and to life, for the Holy Spirit, always present with us, confirming us in our faith and facing us with new challenges for the fellowship of worship and sacrament in which Christ is discovered as Lord of the Church today, for the continuing call to be renewed as the servants of Christ, making his love known and felt in every dimension of experience in the world. Amen. And now the anthem, the Te Deum Laudamus.
And now, symbolically, we will offer the churches to God. I am the Congregational Church. I began in the 16th century in England. It was my strong conviction that the church should be independent from state control. They called my members independents. There is but one Lord of the church and the Christian must be free to hear and follow him first. I have guarded the right of the individual to make his own response to Christ and the gospel and the right of each congregation to decide its own pattern of worship and mission. My members have been in the forefront of social action and missionary witness. They have felt that the church exists to be Christ's servant in the world. For the sake of the new thing Christ is now beginning, I offer to him all that I have been and all that I now am. I am the Methodist Church. They say that I was born in song, and that is partly true. John and Charles Wesley, who brought me into being, gave the gospel rhyme and time. They also put a song into people's hearts. Slaves of the industrial machine found that they were free and joyful children of God. They sang, my chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. But I am more than a singer. I am a social reformer, hitting hard at whatever robs pe people of their true humanity. I have pushed also for moral discipline and the well-ordered life. That is why they call my people Methodists. I have fostered personal growth through small groups and linked our churches together throughout the land in what is known as a connection. For the sake of the new thing Christ is now beginning, I offer to him all that I have been and all that I now am. I am the Presbyterian Church. I was born at the time of great unrest known as the Reformation. What Martin Luther did for the church in Germany, John Calvin and John Knox did for us in France, Switzerland and Scotland in the 16th century. I believe strongly in the sovereignty of God. Before him I bow with awe and reverence. I know that he will remain faithful to his covenant. In fact, they used to call my people the covenanters. I hold that a person is saved by faith alone and that the Bible is the supreme guide for faith and life. I have stood for sound government, scholarship and moral integrity. For the sake of the new thing Christ is now beginning, I offer to him to him all that I have been and all that I now am. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given to your church ministers and members of the people with gifts to govern for the oversight and care of your people and for the management of its affairs. And so we ask you to so direct by the Spirit that what we do at this time may be to the building up of your people in love and good works and to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Mr Murray Martin is to ask questions of the ministers, the parish council and the congregation. Robert Cook, 
Thelma Holmes, Lewis Kelso. Seeing that God by his grace has called you to be his ministers, that you have already made proof of your ministry, and that we are about to commit to your, to your this charge, to your care, we ask you in the name of God and in the presence of this congregation to speak your vows. We now believe, believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and we confess in you the Lord Jesus Christ as, as our Lord and as Saviour. We acknowledge as the supreme standard of faith and duty the word of God as it is found in the Old and New Testaments and perfected in Jesus Christ. We believe that we are truly called by God to the pastoral charge of this parish. We promise to seek the unity and peace of the people of this parish and to cherish the spirit of brotherhood toward all who are doing the deeds of Christ. We, we promise in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ to order our life in accordance with his will and faithfully, diligently and cheerfully to discharge the duties of our ministry, seeking in all things the advancement of the kingdom of God. <coughs> Will the members of the parish council, wherever you are, please stand. Brothers and sisters, members of the parish council, we ask you in the name of God and in the presence of this congregation to speak your vows. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do all these things, grant also to you strength and power to perform the same, that he may accomplish his work, which he has begun in you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Will the congregation please stand? Do you, the members of the participating churches, acknowledge your coming together in the Mount Gambier and District United Parish? We do. Do you acknowledge Robert Cook, Thelma Holmes and Lewis Kelsall as your ministers and the members of the parish council as their fellow workers? And do you, as people called to share with them in a common mission, promise to encourage maintain and strengthen them in their labours, giving them all due honour and support in the Lord. And will you give of your substance as the Lord prospers you for the maintenance of the ministry, the furtherance of the gospel and the advancement of the church beyond this parish? Our commitment to Christ is also a commitment to each other. The uniting church, as we have seen, will be more than the sum total of our membership, buildings, resources and debts. We come together to create a new thing, a new dimension of Christian fellowship, a new witness to the world of reconciliation and unity. God our Father, you can make all things new. We commit ourselves to you. Help us to live for others since your love includes all people, to seek those truths which we have not yet seen, to obey your commands which we have heard but not yet obeyed, to trust each other in the fellowship which you have given to us. And may we be renewed by your Spirit, through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. Amen.
the song One More Step Along the World I Go. Listen for the word of God, reading from the third chapter of the letter to the Philippians. Whatever happens, dear friends, be glad in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you this, and it is good for you to hear it again and again. Watch out for those wicked men, dangerous dogs I call them, who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For it isn't the cutting of our bodies that makes us children of God, it is worshipping him with our spirits. That's the only true circumcision. We Christians glory in what Christ Jesus has done for us and realize that we're helpless to save ourselves. Yet, if anyone ever had reason to hope that he could save himself, it would be I. If others could be saved by what they are, certainly I could. For I went through the Jewish initiation ceremony when I was eight days old, having been born into a pure-blooded Jewish home that was a branch of the old original Benjamin family. So I was a real Jew if ever there was one. What's more, I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to every Jewish law and custom. And sincere, yes, so much so that I greatly persecuted the church. And I tried to obey every Jewish rule and regulation right down to the very last point. But all these things that I once thought so worthwhile, now I've thrown them all away so that I can put my trust and hope in Christ alone. Yes, everything else is worthless compared with the priceless gain of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. I've put aside all else, counting it worth less than nothing, in order that I can have Christ and become one with him, no longer counting on being saved by being good enough, or by obeying God's laws, but by trusting Christ to save me. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith, counting on Christ alone. Now, I've given up everything else. I've found it to be the only way to really know Christ and to experience the mighty power that brought him back to life again and to find out what it means to suffer and die with him. So, whatever it takes, I will be the one who lives in the fresh newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. Now, I don't mean to say that I'm perfect. I haven't learned all that I should even yet, but I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers, I'm still not all I should be, but I'm bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, 
I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling me up to heaven because of what Christ Jesus did for us. Amen. May God bless to us the reading from his word. To his name be the glory and the praise. <clears throat> The year of our Lord, 1976, is a year that will go down in history. Today, we sit on an historic occasion. We mark the end of a century of individual witness and effort by two great churches in Mount Gambia. Today, Methodists, Presbyterians, and some Congregationalists who have been among us for many years, are able to say to each other and to this community, we are one church. No more do we wish to maintain a Methodist witness. No more do a vast majority of Presbyterians wish to maintain a Presbyterian church. And here, I just want to pause for a moment to acknowledge that there are some Presbyterians whose conscience is leading them to remain Presbyterian and to continue a Presbyterian church. We greatly respect their position and their rights and we pledge to them, as we do to all other churches in this community, an openness, a love and a spirit of cooperation. But we who are here this morning as uniting church people wish to be seen no more as different churches, each saying, this is the gospel. No more do we claim that one has more truth or purer doctrine than the other. Today's a wedding day. Today we become a united parish. One church, totally committed to use its influence, its material property, and its message in the involvement of a common calling and a common goal. And that message is to proclaim Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Now, if we believe the scripture read today we will break from the captivity of the past and we will look forward to what lies ahead. Our vision of the future, the prize to which God is calling us, to use the words of Paul, frees us for opportunities for growth and service, opportunities that are given to us by God. This memorable service today captures something of the eagerness of the Lord's presence. And surely, friends, our Lord must be rejoicing to see us here today, worshipping together in this crowd and pledging ourselves to serve us together in the days that lie ahead. He surely must rejoice. And yet, just as the happiness of the wedding day is always followed by both joy and the difficulties of building a happy marriage. So, the enthusiasm of this inaugural celebration will be followed by challenging difficulties, will be followed by adjustments to be made, and the sacrifice of giving, giving, giving. Christ gave his all for us, he calls on us to give for him. And yet, friends, it's an exciting road ahead. Today we look at each other, and I have the advantage because I can look at you. But I wonder today if you happen to be sitting next to someone who comes from another church to what you do. Turn and look at each other and rejoice that we'll be traveling this road together. Will you turn and look at each other now and rejoice that we're traveling this road together from now on. Praise God for that. We're together, friends, 
We're travelling the road ahead together. Let's see who we're travelling it with. I'm reminded of a Peanuts cartoon strip. There's some tremendous philosophy in that little strip. Snoopy the dog appears in the first frame, feeling great and dancing and saying, sometimes I love life so much that I can't express it. And then in the second frame, still dancing, Snoopy says, I feel I want to take the first person I meet into my arms and dance merrily through the streets. And in frame three, Snoopy meets Lucy, who's in a grumpy mood. And you know the expression, everything falls silent. But then in frame four, Snoopy's dancing again, and he says, I feel I want to take the second person I meet into my arms and dance merrily through the streets. The point is, friends, that Snoopy did not permit the grumpy moment to throw its limits on his joyous perspective toward life. And in Snoopy, we have a message for all Christians who have allowed a grumpy moment an unpleasant experience to dictate the whole of their future perspective toward a life of Christian service within the church. You see the lesson, how clear it is. And because they have allowed something like that to turn them away, they have missed out on the most rewarding experience that God can give to man. And so today, friends, our focus needs to be on living now, on this moment, on recognizing God's call to us to a happy and a fulfilling future. Our deliberations on the past, permitting ourselves to be governed entirely by past experiences rather than by a call to Christ's future can only mean stagnation. And none of us want that. And yet, I know that just as all of us, or at least most of us, express some doubt and apprehension as our wedding day approaches, remember that? Many of us today are asking the, the question, have I made the right choice? Friends, I know that many are concerned at this moment about their choice concerning church union. Now these doubts, beware, because they can so easily lead to immobility. And I suggest to you this morning they are brought about because we tend to think of time as a tyrant. You know, hey, how permanent this is. I'm going to have to spend the rest of my life with him or with her. Oh, we seem to be burning so many bridges behind us. And a little apprehension, I guess, is understandable today. But friends, time is not a tyrant. Today's event calls upon you and me to think of our life ahead as God's blessing and opportunity for us. An opportunity to have our faith renewed, restored, an opportunity to be fulfilled by our calling and by our commission. You know what our commission is? To go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's our commission. A call to venture into a joyous new experience. That's why this day is so exciting. Paul puts it much better than I ever could when he says, I leave the past behind and with hands outstretched to whatever lies ahead, I go straight for the goal, my reward, the honour of my high calling by God in Jesus Christ. Man, aren't they healthy, positive and intense words about the Christian lifestyle? About the purpose which is being initiated by today's happy event? 
we reach forward now from this point onwards we reach forward to gain all that matters and all that matters is the proclamation of the gospel a message of peace joy new life for every person every family in Mount Gambia and district every single one of us this morning is called by Christ to demonstrate what Christianity really is and really brings to those who respond to Jesus Christ in a full and committed way. So friends, let's not think of the task ahead as the church's job. It's your job and it's my job. We members of this new church are called to participate with God in his work which in our area means a new life, a new future, a peace and a joy which comes from Christ for this city and this district. Today, God calls us to a course of purposeful forgetting. Now I'm well aware that the word of the Old Testament prophet and what a great and significant word it is when he says remember remember the Lord your God and remember the way he has led you yet I turn to the New Testament and I find Paul saying I turn my back on what is past so what do we have I suggest that we have neither total uh, forgetting nor a total recall because either are unhealthy. The message that God brings to us today is that there is forgiveness to be received, accepted, realized, celebrated, and there is a new life and a new beginning in Christ. And if we wish the future to be bright, we must be able to recognize the many things of the past that must be left here, dropped right now, forgotten. Do you remember Christian, the hero of John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress? He was hampered by an awful load on his back. Load on his back. Oh, so many lives are guilt-driven rather than gratitude-driven, aren't they? And then he saw the cross on the hill and his burden fell off his back, rolled down the hill, and he never saw it again. Today, friends, at this moment, we stand in the historic place, the foot of the cross, and we stand there acknowledging before God the sin of our division. Friends, there are so many things today which we must leave behind and I know that some of them are very cherished possessions, props to our status as Methodists and Presbyterians and Congregationalists. But like a tight collar or necktie or a woman's fashionable but most uncomfortable shoes, we're better off and more useful to our Lord without them. Now, on the other hand, we bring into this new church many valuable traditions, many valuable beliefs and experiences which will give to our united body a richness and a stability which is firmly rooted in the faith of our fathers and the historic teachings and creeds of the church. So the question is, what to leave behind and what to take? And I want to suggest that you try this test. If you can use the memory or the knowledge or the belief gained from your past experience, if you can use that to spread love and peace and joy and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness 
and gentleness, then take it with you. Bring it into the united parish, for it will be valuable for God. But if whatever you have and whatever you believe and whatever traditions and experiences you have had cannot be used for these purposes, which are the true fruits of the Spirit, then drop it here and now. Make a vow that whenever you start to assert your Methodist or your Presbyterian tradition within our new church and you find it is not bringing peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness and gentleness, make a promise to yourself and to God that you will drop it. Love, the Bible says, does not keep a record of wrong. So now, as we forget what needs to be forgotten and rejoice in the things that we will retain and take with us, as we do that today, we find our focus in a new center and a new direction. Today, this service here in this historic place is a refocusing and our act of commitment, which all of us made a few minutes ago, is an individual and a personal determination by each and every one of us. So let none of you think that you can hide from God today in this large congregation. You made that act of commitment. You promised God, and I promised God. And God is calling each of us gathered here today and many others in our television audience to remove our focus from Methodism or Presbyterianism or Congregationalism or Nothingism to remove our focus from those isms to a united future and a common goal. And friends, we need to be very deliberate about this. Our life together in this new church will tend to be withdrawn and sterile unless each of us takes definite and deliberate action to achieve this refocusing toward our new common goal and the road together. How significant it was that we sang a little while ago traveling along the road with you. And there are a lot of us here this morning who are strangers to one another. And I rejoice that those of you who are strangers to me, that we'll be traveling the road together. The church in Russia today is growing in influence and in size despite a deliberate campaign for suppressing it. A few years ago, the Anglican Archbishop Michael Ramsey was visiting the Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow. And during that visit, he was continually put off in his efforts to see some of the Russian churches and meet some of the Russian Christians. But he understood that it would be unwise to make an issue of it. But then, just a few hours before his scheduled departure, permission was given, and he was told that he would, could visit six carefully selected parish churches. And it was just a few hours before he was due to fly back to England. And the first Russian parish priest suddenly notified that Archbishop Ramsey and the Patriarch were on their way, wondered what on earth he could do and so, quick thinking, he went into his church and he rang the church bell vigorously. And people appeared out of their homes and ran into the village square to see what was happening. And when they saw the two church leaders together, they broke into a spontaneous celebration of God's love, a celebration which transcended all the political barriers and limitations that were being felt. And from one parish church to the other, as the two great leaders appeared together, 
the bells gather the people to this historic expression of Christian unity. Today, friends, the bells of our hearts have called us together and now we are gathered to worship, to celebrate historic and joyous action together. Praise God indeed for so wonderful an expression of our unity in Christ. So, what lies ahead for us? What lies ahead? I'm reminded of a woman who once asked her minister if there was anything that he could do about her husband's alcoholism. She said he's, he leads, um, leads uh, he, he makes us lead a miserable life. He said, I wish you'd go and talk to him. Go and talk to him and give him hell. It might bring him to his senses. And the minister said, sure, I'll talk to him, but I won't give him hell. He's had enough of that all his life. I'll give him heaven. Friends, a positive future calls upon this new church to treat Mount Gambia the same way. And I don't mean by that to suggest that Mount Gambia is alcoholic. <laughs> Let me not be misquoted on that. But you see, too frequently in the past, the church's voice has been raised loudest when it has wanted to protest about something. Give them hell. Today, we of this church pledge ourselves to give Mount Gambier and District the joy and the peace of heaven. We pledge ourselves to serve this community. Our influence from now on will be felt in every corner in every organization, political or cultural, every community service, every sporting body, every club, every council, every service organization, we will be there. United Church people with the message of peace and joy and new life in Christ will make their presence and their witness not only felt but evident, meaningful, conciliatory, and sacrificial wherever Mount Gambier and district people meet together for mutual interest or common good or community service. We will be there. And we pledge ourselves to demonstrate and to proclaim to our fellow citizens a positive way of life in which all the fruits of our spiritual life and worship will be evident. We are called and we pledge as disciples of Jesus Christ to make this community a place where love, joy, peace, tolerance and forgiveness are the common experience of every citizen and the Christian ethic of honesty, integrity, community service, and unselfish devotion to the ideals of a Christian community will, through your life and mine, become the hallmarks of a city whose foundation is Jesus Christ and whose builder is God. Amen. Let us worship God with our offering. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
We bring you these gifts because we know that our life and all human life rightfully belongs to you and that everything we have we hold in trust from you. We praise you for everything you have done for mankind in Jesus Christ. Help us through him to make our own offering complete by living in obedience to you. We ask it in his name. Amen. Club Choir will lead us in our worship with the singing of A Way That's Real.
It's a paradoxical world, this world in which we live. There are those who find it hard to believe because they have too many things and there are those who find it hard because they haven't enough. Let us bring this concern to God. Lord, Lord God, God, may your loving care and steadfast love rest upon those for whom we pray. There are those whose lives are in danger through overeating and those who are dying for lack of food. Let us bring this concern to God. Lord God, may your loving care and steadfast love rest upon these for whom we pray. Some have power over their fellow men in business or government and others are exploited or oppressed. Let us bring this concern to God. Others despair, finding the burden of living too great to bear. Let us bring this concern to God. There are sick people, lonely people, sorrowful people and others who give their time and energy and sympathy to help their fellow men in need. Let us bring this concern to God. Lord, let your love at work in us turn our prayers to real concern and effective, and effective action so that we may create in other people faith to overcome disaster and fear and to make them whole. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. After the singing of Shalom, will you please sit for some notices? Let's join in the singing of the hymn, Christ from whom all blessings flow. what is good, never pay back wrong for wrong, encourage the faint-hearted, support the weak and distressed, 
give due honour to everyone, be always joyful, pray continually, give thanks whatever happens, for this is what God in Christ wills for you.